friends, uh, welcome to National Treasures Interviews. Um, National Treasures is a podcast that myself, Will Duggan, and Laura Lex have been doing about lovely days out. Uh, we did a first series at the beginning of 2020 when going outside was a very natural thing that we were allowed to do and enjoyed doing. Uh, and then we finished the first series and then that became illegal. And we're waiting <laughs> for the once more. So we've decided rather than go and visit nice days out, we have Jiminied a little way to make nice days come to us. So what we're doing is a series of uh, interviews, basically TED Talks for idiots. Why did I <laughs> say you could do the intro, Will? This is... course, I'm doing a nice <laughs> job. Uh, so we've got a load of uh, experts in different nice days out that had we been able to do a series two already, we probably would have gone to, but we have snuck into their homes through the magic of 21st century technology, and then we're bringing them to your home. Virtual, very Arthur C. Clarke. So that, I think that's well done me, great intro. Brilliant intro. Anyway, right, so lovely guests. Um, we're, it's not just me and Will chatting to each other, that's the podcast. We can't ruin all of our good stuff here and now. It, we have a guest today who we're very excited to, for you to meet and for us to meet. Um, our guest for this first interview is the wonderful Dr. Kate Stevenson and she is from the National Trust Scotland. Uh, Kate lives in Edinburgh and is a fan of a lot of Scottish properties but one in particular that she's going to talk to us about today. Now Kate is the first person I've ever come across who describes herself as a historian of school uniforms. So, hello, Kate. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Hi. How do you become a historian of school uniforms and why, please? Uh, well, um, I, I might be the only one, and that may be why you've never come across someone describing <laughs> themselves as that before. Um, essentially, it's what I wrote my PhD on, um, and it was something I stumbled in completely accidentally to. Um, I was doing some research during my master's, found this massive academic black hole that no one had written about. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating. And I thought about it for a couple of years and then went and did a PhD on it. Um, so a school just... what's the verdict? Are school uniforms good or bad? Well, so it's not, it's more looking at the history. Um, oh, cool. I mean, there's absolutely no evidence they work. Um, because nobody's really done any research on it but they've got this incredible 500 year history and it's all about gender and class and um, creating idealized identities essentially and letting other people know that's what the school's about. now um so Kate you're here to tell us about a property that you love now you you like a lot of the the Scottish properties but do, yes. where are you taking us virtually today I'm gonna take you to Gladstone's land which is uh, one of the properties I work at um and it is a fantastic city centre property in Edinburgh it's got 500 years of history so it dates back well really to the 16th century but what we know about it is early 17th um, and when it was first built in the state it is now it was this incredibly opulent um, wealthy property right on the high street full of uh, people with lots of money aristocrats the merchant classes and it really sort of exemplifies the heyday of urban living at that period but then come the late 18th, 19th century, it declines massively and it actually almost becomes a slum towards the early 20th century. So it's this incredible story of rise and decline uh, and a reflection of what people, how people are living in Old Town Edinburgh. It's, it's also a time a capsule. It really is. And it's also got some fabulous painted ceilings from 1620, uh, which nobody knew were there. So the National Trust took it over in the 1930s and they, they had no idea they were there and they started renovating it and uncovered, again, absolutely like a time capsule, uncovered these amazing ceilings from the early 1600s. Okay, so we're talking, we're in Edinburgh. We're mm -hmm. on the Royal Mile, which yep. is that sort of cobbly hill from the castle down to Holyrood Palace. Yes. Yep. Okay. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> my, all my Edinburgh fringe years. <laughs> and, and so on a scale of castle to Holyrood, 
Where's Gladstone's castle? So oh, it's car up yeah, here. Yeah, it's on the lawn. Mark. So the Royal Mile is divided into lots of chunks. Um, and so right down the bottom by Holyrood is Canning Gate. And then you've got the High Street, which is where all the flyers are during the Fringe. Yeah. And then you've got Lawn Market and then Castle Hill. So, it's so we're going, if we're coming up from Holyrood, on our right, we've gone past the Deacon Brody Tavern. Yes, it's just after the Deacon Brody Tavern. I yeah. lived above the Deacon Brody Tavern a couple of years ago for the Fringe and the whole thing smelled like chips all the time. <laughs> Would it have smelled like chips back in in the day? So we were actually, we were pottering around it the other day. It's a building site at the moment, but I'll, I'll explain all about that. Um, and, uh, and it smelled like bacon. And we had this moment where we were like, this is, this is what it would have smelled like. This is, so yeah, very possibly it could have smelled the frying and, and potatoes. And... See, in my head now, what I'm picturing is um, I've been watching Harlots lately and it would have started out looking like yeah. Mrs. Quigley's and then by the end it looked a bit more like, you know, Nancy's place. This is just going to be another programme that neither of you have watched. Never mind. Okay, <laughs> right. So I've got a little bit of it in my head and it's a tenement building, so it's like a block of flats? Yes. So in Scotland, a tenement is essentially any a series of apartments, multi-occupancy building, and it doesn't have the associations of slum that it does in a lot of places. So I live uh, I live in a tenement, I'm in a tenement now. Like, it just means a, a basically a, an apartment building. Okay, all right. The kind, and you might not know the answer to this, the kind of flats that you hire when you go to perform at Edinburgh Festival, and it's little doors, and you've got the winding staircases, and they're very sick. That's a tenement. That's a tenement. Right. So tenement is just a block of flats. Just a block of flats, yeah. Right, because tenement feels like we associate it with like, oh, a tenement. Like, why has it got that negative association then? It's it's just, I think, different word usage, particularly in America. Um, and you think of things like the New York tenements. Uh, it just became a word that was associated with slum conditions. Right. Whereas in Scotland, it just never really gained those associations. Yeah. Billy, Billy Connolly would often talk about growing up in a tenement in Glasgow. Yes. It wouldn't mean something like that, would it? He'd mean like the 1960s prefab. So he's actually, no, he's talking about those old tenements. And if you look at pictures of where he grew up, um, yeah, it's those old fashioned tenements. They're just in a lot less, um, there's a lot more people in them than perhaps actually much like a fringe flat, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, um, a bit sort of big families living in quite small spaces. My first Edinburgh, I paid £700 to sleep on a sofa for a mm. month. I, yes, I, before I moved to Edinburgh, I was, um, you know, ev every fringe I was up here and eventually I just didn't go home, which is... From now I... on though, well, it's great because we get to stay with Kate, so we never have to pay <laughs> yeah. for accommodation. <laughs> oh. um, okay, if I was a, oh, do you prefer Kate or Dr. Kate? You've earned the doctor. Oh, okay. Kate is fine. <laughs> if I was somebody who knew nothing about history or Edinburgh or the past or anything, and I said to you, sell me Gladstone land in 20 words. Oh, gosh. And I'll count them. Oh, we oh. all did it. <laughs> Thinking about this carefully. Uh, That's four gone. High rise living. High yeah. Rise living. Decadence in the 17th century. Okay. Long history. Halfway through, doing a great job. Uh, uh, a decline of the old town. Yeah. Five more. Bring it home. Family friendly. Okay. Great cafe. One word left. Ice, oh, ice cream. Yeah, what? that's fine. <laughs> that's cute. Well, you, that was too easy. Do it in 10 words. <laughs> Who's Gladstone? Gl Gladstone? How? What am I saying? Because I want to say Gladstone, but that's not it. Gled both, both are fine. So Gladstones is sort of the old Scots pronunciation, okay. and it's where his name comes from. Gladstone is just the anglicised sort of modern pronunciation of it. Got yeah. So okay, Gladstone so is what we get I'm going to be true to my Scots heritage here. Gladstone. He is the owner of the building, and he opens up like a fancy. So, like, it's not going to be like a hotel, is it? Because you can't travel, you're not staying for one or two nights. Who's renting it and why? 
So, yeah, Thomas Gladstone basically buys up the property in the early 1600s, 1617, actually with his wife's money, let's be honest here. Oh, I love yeah. it when that happens. Be Bessie Cunningham, his wife. So also in Scotland, women don't start taking their husband's names until the 19th century. Uh, so she, Bessie Cunningham, keeps her name, provides, basically provides the money and the status that enables Gladstone to buy the building. Uh, and they... They, when they buy it, it's set well back from the Royal Mile and they basically build this big extension out the front and they put in these fabulous painted ceilings that I've mentioned and they want to make a ton of money off it. So they start renting out these high quality apartments. So early 1600s, we actually know exactly who's living there, which is really cool. Uh, so we have a Scottish aristocrat called Crichton. Um, and he is super controversial because he is accused of burning his enemies alive in his own castle. <laughs> uh, so uh, he was actually up in Edinburgh for the trial and he, he ended up basically put, laying the blame on someone else uh, and somebody else actually got hanged for the, the whole debacle. Uh, but the whole family, uh, there's, a, there's a whole reputation associated with the family and his son actually dies on the battlefield in really suspicious circumstances sometime later. Um, and I, yeah, I suspect he might have been lynched by his own men, but that is an entirely Kate theory. Oh, wow. uh, a merchant called John Riddock. Um, and we know a ton about him because he left an incredibly detailed will uh, with all of the things he was selling out of Gladstone's land. And he's basically a luxury goods merchant and he's selling fabrics and expensive spices and tobacco and weirdly gunpowder uh, out of the ground floor of Gladstone's land, um, along with his wife. Uh, who else do we have in the building? Um, we have, oh, we have William Struther as well, who is the minister of St Giles Cathedral, which is um, a huge cathedral, just a little bit further along the Royal Mile. And he absolutely fire and brimstone known for these incredible sermons and he wrote a whole series of books which read in a very similar manner <laughs> uh, and he was also involved in witch trials so a really interesting man because at this period Scotland is all about hunting witches. Okay so then and, the, and we're talking so Edinburgh is divided into the old town and the new town and at this point, the new town didn't exist, did it? No, not at all. So, are we does how does the Royal Mile work at this point? Is it fancy and down to unfancy? How does it work in so terms it, of fancy? It works more so for anyone that hasn't been to Edinburgh. The Royal Mile is this this sort of this long road, and it's central Edinburgh, and it's on a ridge, and it slopes down either side of the Royal Mile. So there are all these amazing little alleyways called closes that all run off uh, the, the central ridge. And they run down to what is now Princess Street Gardens on one side and Cowgate on the other. Um, and they're both a lot lower. So actually the way it worked was wealthy people lived up on the high street okay. and then poorer people lived lower down the hill. Um, and that's partly because when it rained, everything, all the, the, the filth on the high street washed down the hill. Uh, so you obviously wanted to be at the top where that wasn't happening. Okay. How, um, was the high street so called because it was literally... Higher. So it takes its name originally at this point it's called Kingis High Street, so basically the King's High Street, but it, it's quite possible that's what it comes from. I don't actually don't actually know the answer to that. Mm. I think well, High Street is the most common street name in Britain. I think I remember that being a Trivial Pursuit question once. Again, What's it's, it's with the because you know where it is on the outside because it's got like an eagle holding a rat. What's uh -huh. that all about? So the, the name, this is a bit of sort of 1980s National Trust creating a story, but it's a really great story. <laughs> uh, so uh, the name Gladstone, so Gledstains, comes from the Scots word for a, a kite, a bird of prey, uh, which is a gled, um, crops up in, if you go back and look at sort of old Scots poems and things, you'll, you'll find it there, and stains, which is basically a stone. So he's, he's you know, kite stone. And a lot of people use their names to, to sell things, to name their businesses after. So there is a working theory that um, Gladstone would have advertised, he because he was also a merchant, would have advertised his business um, with some sort of a play on his name. Um, and we certainly know that he had um, birds and a bird of prey painted onto the ceiling in the third floor. Could it be part of the, um, you, someone told me a long time ago that, Pubs are so-called like the the X and Y 
because people couldn't read. They'd recognise a drawing of, say, you know, the cow and moon. If you're looking for Gledstains at this time, you'd see the picture and be like, oh, like, three balls is pawnbroker, red and white is barber. That's Gledstains land. That's Gled absolutely. And it is. It's more than possible. What, who's your favourite uh, character from all of the tenants that you know so of? I, I'm a modern historian. Like, I, I really like the 18th and 19th century. And I've got very attached to a woman called Mary Wilson. Uh, so she ran a boarding house in 1911. Uh, so she, was, she put an advert in The Scotsman uh, for two to three respectable men to share one of these front painted chambers, one of these big front rooms with the, the painted ceilings. And... She's just such a good indication of what's going on at Gladstone's Land at this period. She's a widow. She's bought part of the building essentially as her pension. And she's, she, uh, she, first of all, she has her daughter and her daughter's new husband living with them. And then they move out and she opens up this boarding house. And we don't know a huge amount about it, but you can get these little, little sort of glimpses from the advert and from the some later. We actually had a few years back. Uh, somebody who'd lived in the building in the 20s show up and uh, he didn't remember Mary Wilson but he remembered her successor a woman called Eleanor Leake that took on her boarding house. So why did this di go down I, decline was the word you used I, in fact I even <laughs> wrote it down when you said it so I'd remember the good word so, um wh why did it decline then why why did the old town become scummy? Basically the new town so you mentioned the new town and the new town, they start building it in 1767. So Edinburgh is really overcrowded, even in the 1600s. It is, um, and that's why the buildings are so tall. If you wander around Edinburgh and you look up and they, they, go, they just go up. And Glad we're, we've got seven stories at Gladstone's Land. Uh, and it was just to fit more people in because there were so many people living in such a small space. And of course, it already being quite crowded in the 1600s, as the population expanded into the 18th century, it just got more and more overcrowded. And uh, that's not what people want. It's just not fashionable anymore. So there are all these calls to do something better. And they, they do start knocking some buildings down and improving things, but it, there's really nowhere for the old town to expand. So 1766, the council put out a competition to design a new town, um, and it's won by an architect. He's really young. He's in his 20s, and it always makes me feel like I've achieved nothing. And come the sort of the 1770s, 1780s, there's all these amazing, spacious, fashionable new town houses, and everybody that can afford it just starts moving out of the old town. And then they start building assembly rooms and theatres, so fashionable life moves to the new town right. okay and everybody that is fashionable and wealthy enough moves with it so come the sort of the mid 19th century they've all gone and that leaves old town to really sort of the working classes the poorer members of society and that's when it starts to decline i love i love the old town oh yeah oh, it's, I like it much better than the new town i guess now it's almost sort of going back the other way because now we love kitsch but up until the 1950s, uh, we have volunteers at Gladstone's Land who remember being told not to go down the Royal Mile after dark because it was such a dodgy area wow. um, in the 50s and early 60s. And then really it sort of regenerated. It's a cool thing about Scotland that you can say that a town built in the mid 1700s is it's new. There's no history there. <laughs> <laughs> you can be like, yeah, no, not none of this modern crap. <laughs> One of my favourite things is in the new town, and it's by the, it's at the Nat West or near the George IV Square. There's a plaque for the official opening of the new town, like is it 1775? So the the new town is a year older than the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, because Scotland's really at the front. Like the Enlightenment, like Scotland produced a hell of a lot of inventors and some amazing minds that were all that kind of time, weren't they? Absolutely. Edinburgh was, it was hilariously dubbed the Athens of the North, which when you think about the, the weather here is... is, is <laughs> so good. Um, so what we would love to do now, um, have you got any questions for us on things we should know? 
do. I do. Well, I've, I don't know whether you should know them or not, but we'll, we'll try it. I mean, you've both, you've both spent a lot of time in Edinburgh. Well, you, so. You've answered all of our questions so well, so we feel like it's only right that we should try and answer some of yours. So I've, I've got a few to throw at you. Uh, so we talked about the, the Royal Mile having all of these, these lovely little winding alleyways running off them. And wherever you go in the country, these little alleyways have different names. So I'm sure people have come across Snickets and Venels. Um, Twitten. So That's what it was down where Twitten. we were, I think. What was it, sorry? Twitchell, where I grew up. Oh, that's a good word. Ooh. So it's Snicket, where I grew up in York, or Snickleways. Uh, but in Edinburgh and Glasgow, they're called Closes. Now, why, why would they be called Closes? <laughs> yes. They're very narrow. So the two sides are very close to each other. I, I mean, that's true. <laughs> I, I don't think it's why it's called closer, but it's also true. Uh, yeah, so one of the reasons these little alleyways are so close together is, again, to fit more people in, so these buildings were. Um, and actually, it would have been much, much worse than it is now. They would have, um, there wouldn't have been any of the little squares that you find around, things like Macca's Court, which, um, which have opened it all up. Very, very close together. Um, Nobody actually knows for sure, but the most probable theory is that they were closed at night. So they actually gave access oh. to back tenements and um, sort of the backs of buildings. And a lot of them were gated. You'll still see some of them are gated today if you walk down the Royal Mile. Uh, and the, the, the sort of the most common theory is that it, it was simply something you closed. Right, what are the, oh, I know what time it is. It's probably time to talk about poo, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I mean, it was going to happen at some point. <laughs> uh, so we talked a little bit about some of the filth on the Royal Mile. Uh, sewerage doesn't actually come to Edinburgh till really, certainly the old town, well into the 19th, 19th century. I thought um, you the 90s. <laughs> no, no, yeah. the 1990s. No, the 19th century. Uh, what? No flushing toilets, obviously. No sewer pipes. People are doing doing their business in a chamber pot, or a, a sort of a close stool, which is just a fancy chamber pot. Where does it go? Does it go? Because on the mile, they've got those good gutters that go down. Did they just have little rivers? Because I think was it in um. Is it Rome where they originally had like like big stones that would come up and you'd sort of hop from one to the other and then all the effluents and stuff kind of went around the stones? There are definitely, yeah, there's definitely examples of that. Those gutters weren't actually put yeah. in until the 19th century. So okay. you could argue that maybe in the 19th century. Was it used by um, tanners? Oh. So, oh, so this is really interesting. Urine was used by all sorts of people. Um, so Tanners did use it, uh, but it was used in so much cloth manufacture as well. So uh, tweed originally was treated with stale urine um, and it was also used in dyeing processes as well. So there is, there is, there is some uses for that. Oh, it was used as a stain remover. There's an amazing, I, I, I don't want to say recipe, but essentially a recipe for creating a stain remover from stale urine because um, so you soaked your your undergarments in it overnight. What would you possibly have spilt on yourself that was worse than just being covered in piss? <laughs> I mean, you'd wash it off. <laughs> I can't imagine like spilling a glass of red wine on my sofa and then just oh, hang on a minute, I'll just weird. piss on it. <laughs> what are they doing with them? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what are they doing with? What are they doing with poo? Well, they're doing two things with it. There's a big difference between what they're supposed to be doing with it and actually what they're doing with it. So, what they're supposed to do, there is actually a system for disposal of it. There are men that are paid to bring carts round, and you're supposed to take your chamber part and you're supposed to carry it all the way downstairs, and you're supposed to put it onto the night soil carts, and then they take it away and they use it as fertilizer on agricultural land. Uh, but, you know, if you're on the 12th storey of a tenement and it's raining outside, you're not going to carry your poo all the way down to the little man with his night soil car, are you? Oh, you're going to yeah. check it out the window. Yeah. And that's absolutely what people did. Uh, and we know that that's what they're doing. Um, well, we know that's what they're doing in Gladstone's land because one of the neighbours complains that somebody keeps checking the contents of their chamber pot onto his flat roof. They dug out one of the dug out one of the 
closes and they took away a ton of waste. Uh, so people, they keep trying to bring in bits of legislation to stop people doing this. And my absolute- They haven't. In my first year of Edinburgh, I was in opium on Cowgate and somebody did a massive human poo in that alleyway on day one and it stayed there until the end of the festival. Oh, oh it was gross. <laughs> wow. Oh, Edinburgh. Doing a human poo. <laughs> this bloke squatted down, did a fox shit. <laughs> Love this. Yeah, so um, they, they do try and stop people doing it. Um, and in 1749, they bring on this amazing piece of legislation called the Act of Nastiness or the Nastiness Act. Oh, that's great. Like, Can you imagine being like, what's this? It's the Nastiness Act. It sounds like an 80s band, doesn't it? The Human League and the Act of Nastiness. Yes. Yeah. Death Row Records, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, that basically prevents you doing it. It means that you can, you can get into a whole world of trouble if you do it during daylight hours, but they can't police it at night. So yeah. you can do what you want at night. Oh, it's um, like it, fly tipping, but really gross. But really gross, yeah. Um, and the the story goes in Edinburgh that you would you would shout before you chucked it out your window, and you would shout "Guardy Lou," uh, and then heft it out the window as a warning, so uh, you didn't didn't cover anyone in it, which was also a problem with throwing it out your window. What does "Guardy Lou" mean? Uh, so again, it's one of those things that no one's a hundred percent sure, but the uh, the most probable thing is that it comes from it's a corruption of the French from like yes. Garde Low, so like watch the water. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you go. Ah, yeah, that was a gloriously disgusting. I love it. Uh, this is exactly what I'm here for. history. Okay, so you guys haven't seen Harlots and New Girl. Um, you are not watching as much television as me, and that's very sad for you both. Um, but so, if we're talking Gled Stain's Land, wh what might we know this sort of period of history or this area from in popular culture? Are we, where are we on a scale of Erwoolly to something else, Scott? <laughs> I mean, the, okay. the say some Scottish, Laura. Well, I was going to say Outlander, but then I was like, well, maybe this is Outlander time. So it I didn't want to. You're, you're absolutely oh, right. Okay, brilliant. Bang on. So the closest you're going to get is Outlander with what what we've sort of got kicking around at the moment. Uh, it is sort of 17th, 18th century. So it's very much the heyday of Gladstone's Land. Uh, it was filmed all around Edinburgh. So actually, if you watch it, you will find loads of National Trust of Scotland properties. You will find lots of bits of the Royal Mile on there. They filmed down on Bakehouse Close. They filmed out at Preston Mill, New Hales, which is about four miles out of Edinburgh, one of, one of the other properties that I work at. So they, yeah, absolutely. They're using all of these, these amazing sort of 17th and 18th century locations around Edinburgh. Sadly, not Gladstone's land. Uh, we <sighs> were, I know, I know. But that's uh, okay, because that's on this now, which will get it just as much exposure. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and obviously there's been a massive Outlander, so pe people come on Outlander pilgrimages to Edinburgh to see where it was filmed. <laughs> Outlander was, the, it was genuinely a moment for me where I'd watched, I'd been watching that and I'd been watching Game of Thrones and then I was feeling really anxious. It was like, well, yeah, you keep watching people getting murdered and beaten and just start watching something nicer, you dumb ass. <laughs> What's the Vicar of Dibley? Yes, which I actually did at the beginning of lockdown. I rewatched all of it. It's very good. Stand oh, it's so good, isn't it? <laughs> I do find it weird that uh, Councillor David Horton, the Tory party manifest, is played by a man called Gary. This is, this is really exciting because Gladstone's Land is actually closed for renovation at the moment. So what we what we've had in the past is going to change a little bit. So we we've we've always had this the ceilings on display. We've always had a sort of the seventeenth century story we've been telling, um, and actually we're telling much more. We're we're opening up a third floor that hasn't been on display, which has the coolest ceiling. It's got birds and animals and all sorts of really fun things on it, including a little monkey. Uh, and we're telling the whole story. So we are we're keeping the first floor as this sort of 17th century merchant's house. We're, we're specifically zoning in on John Riddick, who I talked about earlier. And then the we've got a draper's shop from the 18th century up on the second floor, which is 
so cool. Uh, and then Mary Wilson's boarding house, which is spending all the time with her on the third floor. Uh, so you'll be actually be able to see the decline of the property and, and what happens over the whole period. Uh, so that's really exciting. So that's the whole visitor experience is being redone. So we're due to reopen on the 1st of April. Uh, and uh, really what we're doing is a bit different for the trust. They've never, never done this elsewhere, but everything is going to be really, um, I loathe to use the word interactive, but you can touch things. So good for kids? Absolutely good, great for families, but also we're, we're aiming it at sort of young people as well. Um, so there are, um, essentially it's, it's going to be a space to explore. You can open cupboards, you can try things on, you can, all the things I want to do in stately yeah. homes, but not allowed to do what's accessibility like if you're not great on your feet because scotland can be difficult if you're yes it is and that's who i would say it's probably not great for so the whole ground floor will be accessible um but it is the rest of the building is it's only accessible by a steep turnpike staircase so a spiral staircase um so it's not ideal if you have any sort of problems with no. those sort of stairs okay. um, but we are putting together our own uh, sort of audio tour so if you do want to come with your family and sit in the cafe and listen to an audio tour of the building while they go and have a look around you will be able to do that oh so that's great though but so if you're not sighted but you'd like to sort of go and experience it from an audio yeah. tour you could and i presume yeah. like if you if you've not got hearing there's lots to read and see about there's really lots of, great lots of information to read and there's going to be some smells to go alongside with that mm. we've been working with an amazing smell designer over in glasgow um who did some a stuff smell well. designer oh, what a cool job like she is so cool you know when you're a little bit like i just want to be a bit more like you yeah uh, she's brilliant and um, she runs the glasgow scent library um and she puts i know right Hang on, ha we've buried the lead on this. There's a scent designer and a Glasgow scent library. Yes. She's I'm imagining like a nice version of Gronwy from Perfume. <laughs> She's <laughs> brilliant. So basically, Dead Stains Land, you want all of us to go there. Thank We're going there if we want to see sort of a little time capsule of Edinburgh history from the okay. 17th century right up to sort of the mid 20th century yeah. um and we can get interactive with it we can see some amazing ceilings yes i'm yes. in i'm uh, sold yeah no it's it, it is going to be such an exciting space um, and it's going to be so much fun like it's it was great to visit before but i think it was a very traditional audience and i think it's still going to be great for traditional audiences but it's I think we're moving away a little bit from that and making it a little bit more fun for families and things like that. Perfect way to celebrate the new tax year really isn't it? Go, go to Glaston Land on the 1st of April when it reopens. Yeah April Fool's Day. Well Dr Kate Stevenson thank you so much for joining us thank you very much for agreeing to be our first interviewee um, for no our series. Um, where can people find you if they're interested in more of your research? Oh, absolutely. Well, you can follow Gladstone's Land on social media, but you can also find me on Twitter. I um, So it's at Dr. K Stevenson. Um, and I, I do tweet a lot of drivel about my life, but I also throw out uh, academic things. Uh, I um, we did a oh, we did a podcast um, which related to Gladstone's Land and um, historical sex work in Edinburgh, which is something I've been researching recently. Um, so you can find that on um, new research in uh, Scottish history as well. So if you want to hear more of my voice, you can go and have a listen to that. Um, and that's all on my Twitter account as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kate Stevenson, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks a lot. So um, William, we yeah. did all right there, didn't we? Yes, I think that uh, Graham Norton, Parkinson, <laughs> Wogan, your boys took a hell of a beating. <laughs> Thank you for watching. We are Laura Lex and Will Duggan, and we are the National Treasures Podcast. Uh, if you haven't listened to Series 1, it is all available wherever you get your podcasts. And we are currently working hard on Series 2. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can email us at... Treasures Pod. Still, always the same. I never know. You just do it. It's much better when you do it. You can email us at nationaltreasurespodcast at gmail.com. You can tweet us at Treasures Pod. You can find us on Instagram at Treasures Pod. You can find us on Facebook, but we're not there, but have a nice little look if you need. My phone number is 07590 
you can figure out the rest. Yay. Thank you very much for watching. We'll be back with more interviews and bits and pieces. Uh, have a lovely whatever time it is that you're watching this. Goodbye. Enjoy.